All right, welcome everyone to our fourth presentation in our spring webinar series for this Wisconsin Citizen Lake Monitoring Network. This is Paul Skowinski. I'm the statewide educator for the network. A couple of reminders before we begin today. All of our webinars will be recorded for later viewing, so you'll be able to find a recording of today's webinar on the UWEX Lakes YouTube channel. I'll send out a link to the recording either today or tomorrow for everyone who registered. Feel free to share that link further if other people around your lake or people in your family would be interested in watching the recorded webinar. Oh, I hear somebody talking. Is it you, Al? <laughs> Al, I did hear you speak. I am going to mute everybody, though, just to minimize background noise here. If you have questions during the webinar today, please just post them into the chat box. There should be a toolbar on the bottom of your screen that will pop up if you move your mouse. And there's a chat button there that you can use to enter questions into. And Katie and I can both see those questions. It'll be up to Katie whether she'd like to take those questions as they come or wait till the end. It's, it's up to her. Um, so our guest speaker today is Katie Belfast, who is the Outreach Programs Director for the Wisconsin Wetlands Association. Uh, sorry, I forgot to mention, next week's webinar, just so you know, is coming up on Tuesday, Shoreline Gardening in Wisconsin. It'll be myself and Patrick Goggin, both of us from the Extension Lakes Program, so tune in for that next week. Getting to today's webinar again. Katie Belfast is here from the Wisconsin Wetlands Association to talk to us about wetlands. Katie coordinates Wisconsin Wetlands Association's organizational communications, leads the planning for the Wetland Science Conference, assists private wetland landowners with their management questions, and spearheads the Ramsar Initiative with the association. Katie has a master's degree in land resources from the Univ University of Wisconsin-Madison's Gaylord Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies, and has more than 20 years of nonprofit conservation experience. Katie, you can go ahead and share your slides. Let's make sure that's working okay. And then I'll turn it over to you. Okay, working on that. All good, coming through? All right, I see it. Paul, would you like me to have video on or off? I forgot to ask you that question. It's up to you. Uh, most of the time, uh, I guess about half and half so far, our presenters have, have been half on, half off. So it's up to you. Okay. I'm gonna turn mine off so I get more uh, screen myself for this presentation. Okay. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, this is my first foray into the bold world of uh, webinars. I've been giving lots of presentations over the years. Uh, and have now been asking people to give presentations for Wisconsin Wetlands Association via um, webinars and meetings like this. Uh, I miss your faces. I miss uh, not being able to see our audience, but we'll, we will carry on and uh, please do put questions in the chat box as we go along um, as that's the way that I'll know that you're there. I really appreciate the invitation, Paul. It's, uh, it's great to be here. So I'm going to give us a little uh, foray through uh, Wisconsin's wetlands, but before I get started, I want to just uh, describe who we are as an organization for anybody who's not familiar with us. Uh, Wisconsin Wetlands Association is a non-governmental, non-profit organization. We're dedicated to helping landowners and communities care for wetlands by understanding how wetlands can be used as solutions to the water-related issues they face. Certainly wildlife um, is, a, is an important part of the importance of wetlands, um, but I'll, as I'll get to later, uh, we are moving more to thinking about wetlands and encouraging others to think about wetlands as really important uh, solutions for the, some of the water challenges that we have in our state. And I know you all are familiar with a lot of those um, as lake monitors. So uh, but we're moving forward here. Sorry, I'm just trying to get my things. There we go. Uh, so let's start with the basics. What are wetlands? Uh, there are lots of definitions for this. There's regulatory definitions involving soil and plants and water and all kinds of things and how many days they have to be saturated, blah, blah, blah. But we're going to keep things simple here today and just start with this idea that wetlands are those places that are in between the places that are always dry and the places that are always wet. And so that leaves us in that really um, variable zone in the middle. Uh, some wetlands are closer to the always dry 
and some wetlands are closer to the always wet and there's lots of different kinds in between and because those water levels fluctuate uh, that makes wetlands very dynamic and very diverse which is why we have uh, such a wide variety of wetlands um, in Wisconsin. Now, of course, uh, this is a picture that I think we all could agree is a wetland. Uh, pretty much everywhere I go, people describe this kind of image. You got your cattails, you got your open water, you have your water birds. Um, so we pretty much all agree that uh, these kinds of marshes and deep water wetlands are wetlands. Um, but that's only one type of community that we have here in Wisconsin. Um, and one of the things that I do is help sort of broaden uh, the uh, the concept of what wetlands are in Wisconsin so that we, we move not only to include uh, these marshes, but um, lots of other different wetland types, including sedge meadows and low prairies. These kinds of wetlands were among the most abundant wetlands in southern Wisconsin in particular, but they were also among the easiest wetlands to convert because they are less wet than marshes, for example. They're easier to drain. But they're super important because they provide a lot of the water management benefits that we'll be talking about um, later today. Floodplain forests occur along our rivers, creeks, and streams. Uh, they are seasonally inundated each spring and during high precipitation events, but generally dry out at other times of the year. Some floodplains have trees and some don't, but a lot of them are no longer connected to their rivers, and thus they can't do the important work of managing water that we so need. Uh, forested wetlands. Uh, we also, we, lots of people use the word swamps uh, very broadly to refer to sort of any kind of uh, wetland community, let alone a uh, political environment. Um, but in this case, uh, these are actually the true swamps, these forested wetlands. Um, one of the things that uh, differentiates swamps from floodplains is, well, A, they don't have to be connected to a riverway, but um, they also are more generally connected with sort of vertical water movement, uh, meaning a rise and fall of of groundwater um, up above the soil surface, unlike the sort of lateral movement of floodplain waters. Uh, shrub thickets. Uh, this is always a funny picture to use, right? Because you don't see very much, but this is what it looks like when you're in a shrub thicket. Uh, you are surrounded with a lot of uh, thick shrubbery. Uh, in the north, that's mainly, uh, mostly uh, alder. Uh, and in the south, we have uh, shrub car as a community type featuring different shrub species, particularly common along lake river and stream shorelines. Fens are spring-fed wetlands uh, with some cool, unique characteristics. These were most common, or are still most common, in the, the agricultural portions of Wisconsin in the south. Um, they're often associated with limestone um, bedrock, and so they're high in calcium and magnesium. Um, and because of this groundwater, this highly uh, nutrient-rich groundwater, um, you have very specialized plant communities. These are among the rarest community types in Wisconsin. Bogs are similarly uh, have cool, uh, unique limiting uh, features. Uh, they're typically found in uh, the northern forested portions of our state, although they do come down as, as you know, Cedarburg Bog is one of the most well-known uh, bogs in Wisconsin that's down further south, just north of Milwaukee. These generally get their water from precipitation, not from groundwater, and as a result are generally lack the sort of nutrient-rich uh, water of a fen or other wetland type, um, and are instead usually acidic, and often um, sphagnum moss that grows in these bogs uh, add to that um, acidity by uh, just they, their very nature. They crank out um, acid as part of their life cycle. Uh, so again, many of the plants that grow in bogs are highly adapted to these challenging growing conditions that uh, other plants just simply can't deal with. Now this beautiful picture of a bog um, is, has a quite large open area, uh, but that is not always the case. Uh, in many cases, um, these are uh, don't have a lot of open water, um, and so sometimes don't, it's important to have sort of a picture that it could have open water, but it doesn't have to. Some of the least recognized wetlands on our landscape are these ephemeral and seasonal ponds because they normally dry out for some of the year. A lot of, and so they're overlooked by a lot of people who don't recognize them as wetlands. Um, there was a famous uh, uh, case, uh, it was probably more than 10 years ago now, where a landowner was disputing um, a, a wetland protection measure in an area where he was trying to build. And he said, that's not a wetland. I can drive my truck through there. That can't possibly be a wetland. Um, well, he had this kind of seasonal wetland on his property. I bet you that all of you have driven or know somebody who has driven cars on lakes in Wisconsin in the winter. 
But nobody would say that those aren't lakes because they could be driven on. We know that they're lakes, they're just in a different form, a different time of their life where they're frozen because of the seasons. The same is true for ephemeral and seasonal ponds. They, um, they are wet in the spring and summer, and then they dry out over the course of the summer and into the fall. So this, these four photos here are um, the same wetland from the same vantage point in four points of the same year. So you can see the very wetness um, in the upper left-hand photo, and then it sort of goes uh, to the right and then down, and the, obviously the fall one with the leaves on the ground, it's dry as a bone, and you might not think that was a wetland. Uh, but these are incredibly important for both their water holding and nutrient properties, nutrient processing processing properties, but also um, for their habitat. Sometimes they are in forested landscapes and sometimes they're in agricultural landscapes, but they're incredibly important for our amphibian friends uh, who rely on them for their breeding because these seasonal ponds do not support fish uh, um, on a routine basis. These are great places to lay your eggs because you know your little babies are not gonna get gobbled up the minute you pop those eggs down. So super important for um, our spring calling friends. I loved that uh, call, uh, calls that you were playing at the beginning of this webinar, Paul. That was really fun. It's a great time of year for frog calls. So that's a quick tour of wetland types in Wisconsin. Again, there's a lot more uh, detailed uh, classification systems for wetlands. Army Corps has one, the DNR has one. There's, there's lots of different systems. It depends on what you need, to what, what, the purpose for why you're classifying. I will point out that we uh, had Ryan O'Connor from Wisconsin DNR on our wetland coffee break uh, presentation series last Friday. And he gave a presentation that went into a lot more detail on the wetland community types in Wisconsin and why they occur where they occur, what's happening with the hydrology and the landscape that makes wetlands show up in different places. So if you're interested in a more detailed run through of Wisconsin's community types, um, I can at the end of this talk, uh, make sure I put in the link so that you can go and find the recording of that presentation. It's wisconsinwetlands.org on the wetland coffee break page, but I'll provide a more specific link. So next we move on to what good are wetlands? Um, and I'm gonna show a quick video that covers those basics and then we'll talk a little bit more. Oh, I didn't share my sound. So that's not gonna work. Paul, we didn't practice this one. Well, if you click share screen again and choose new share, I think, uh, you should be able to find that box that says share computer sound. Alrighty. Thank you for the tips. Do you remember fishing with your grandpa, catching frogs at the water's edge? Some of these precious childhood memories of nature tie back to we wetlands. You do. Yep. Wetlands occur between the places that are always wet and the places that are always dry. Not only do they give us great memories, they also protect the health and safety of our communities. They reduce flood damages, help keep our waters clean, and ensure we have water to drink and use in our businesses. But the ability of wetlands to provide these benefits depends on how we use and manage our land and water. Across much of... Now we just lost the sound and the video stopped. Oh dear. Because I went to look at the chat box the state the changes we have made to our landscape have disrupted this ability and as a result we're seeing more flood damages and water quality problems the good news is that wetlands can be an important part of the solutions to these problems and by understanding how wetlands work we can begin the exciting process of restoring wetlands to help heal wisconsin's waters because water flows downhill we can't fix issues downstream if we don't fix problems upstream so let's start at the top and look at how it's all connected, the watershed. A watershed is an area where all surface waters, lakes, rivers, streams, and wetlands drain to a shared body of water. But wetlands in different parts of a watershed manage water in different ways. 
Wetlands in the upper parts of a watershed form in low spots on the land. These wetlands capture, store, and slowly release runoff from rain and snowmelt. They may not always look like wetlands. They're wet in spring and dry by late summer, and often they don't even appear to be connected to streams or rivers, but they are critical. Here's how. Individually, these wetlands may be small, but they can be locally abundant. Together, they hold and manage a lot of water and literally slow the flow, allowing the water to soak into the ground. This reduces erosion and flood peaks and helps protect downstream roads and neighborhoods. Wetlands in the middle part of the watershed form along rivers and creeks, giving them room to swell during high water. They are most commonly known as floodplain wetlands. When floodwaters spread out across a floodplain, they slow down and spread out. Slow removing water has less erosion causing energy and water that can spread out means lower flood peaks downstream. Wetlands in the lower parts of a watershed form where rivers empty into larger bodies of water, especially lakes. Where rivers flatten out, the current disperses and the river drops its load of sediments and other material. This makes the water that enters the lake cleaner and clearer, which means better fishing, swimming, and boating. So are the wetlands near you healthy and abundant enough to support watershed health, or are they too damaged to do the work you need them to do? If you don't know the answer, you're not alone. But if you're concerned about water quality and flooding and care about fish and wildlife, encouraging your community to explore how local wetlands are or are not supporting watershed health is a great place to start. Working together, we can use wetlands as solutions in our communities. And at the same time, we can ensure that our kids and grandkids create the same treasured childhood memories we hold dear. very strange. I'm glad you guys could hear it. I could hear absolutely nothing, but I hope that you enjoyed that beautiful little video. Um, I'm happy to tell you that this video was selected for the 2020 Wild and Scenic Film Festival, which happened in California in January. And it was supposed to be part of the touring show that was um, happening now, but of course uh, those have all moved online as well. It was scheduled to be shown at festivals between all the way from New Hampshire to Washington State. It all is online and we have made that video and the other videos that we have made um, available to anybody who would like to use them as part of their wetland outreach. Um, so if that's a piece that you think folks in your lake would be interested in, in your community, um, that is available to you um, to download and use in your programming. So uh, upper watersheds are critical. As you saw in that video, they are our first line of defense against unregulated runoff, but they are also lost at a greater rate than pretty much the other wetlands in Wisconsin because of their seasonality and that they don't look like wetlands at other time of the year. When we are missing uh, these upper watershed wetlands, the water that would have been held in these wetlands moves um, earlier in the spring and much more swiftly downstream than they would have if, uh, if than it would have if we these upper watershed wetlands were there. Um, and so uh, everything moves faster. You see more erosion. You see, uh, you know, lots of other uh, problems because we don't have that water soaking into the ground and slowing uh, at the top of the watershed. Um, these upper watershed wetlands, as as we saw in the video, are really important for recharge and for maintaining base flow, and they're great waterfowl habitat. Um, this particular one is uh, in St. Croix County. Um, we've also lot, uh, lost a lot of our floodplain wetlands. Uh, many of our rivers have been disconnected from their floodplains. We have channelization, levee development, channel clearing, lots of different things, and flow restrictions like dams and road crossings. Um, this particular photo is a healthy floodplain in La Crosse County. Now, because we have lost those wetlands, we see um, uh, some problems like this. Uh, generally speaking, as we said before, wetlands reduce runoff energy. When uh, in this particular picture in Bayfield County, um, the wetlands uh, above this wetland that you see on the left where the cute little puppies are, um, it's lost a lot of those upper watershed wetlands above this particular one. And so it's, it's getting more water than it can manage. And you can see the energy coming out of that uh, wetland when there's a big flood event has just scoured the heck out of this um, area and they've lost a lot of soil. And, and uh, it's gonna be very hard to build that up again to um, uh, bring back the services that that wetland once provided. 
So you need to look upstream for these solutions when you've got issues like this. Um, they improve water quality. Um, this, uh, these, this photo, pair of photos, was taken on the very same day uh, on opposite sides of the very same road. The picture on the left was taken of uh, runoff coming from an agricultural field in the spring. And across the street, the other runoff was coming off of a restored wetland that had been an agricultural field and had been restored back to wetlands. And you can just see the difference in water clarity. Um, this is not to say we should get rid of agriculture, but we just need to be smarter about um, how we manage water coming off of agricultural fields. And you guys know probably better than anybody how well wetlands protect our shorelines. When you have um, intact wetlands along the shores of lakes, um, those plants uh, buffer the wave action and reduce the energy and thus uh, reduce shoreline erosion in addition to providing really great habitat. Carbon storage is another thing that you hear a lot more about. It's mostly when wetlands uh, that have the vegetative matter does not degrade from year to year because of the hydric conditions, because of the saturated water conditions. And so that carbon is stored. When those uh, wetlands are, are drained, those uh, soils dry out and that carbon is released. And so that's um, a challenge um, moving forward uh, in some of these areas where we've had a lot of wetland drainage or where that's uh, a risk. Great uh, trout and lake fish habitat. Often trout folks don't think wetlands and trout go together, but actually because of that base flow situation we've talked about, um, they're super important for chat, uh, uh, trout habitat. I'm pausing for a moment because I have not been paying attention to the chat and I just want to take a quick peek at that. All right, we will keep going here. Uh, and of course, wildlife habitat. Now my boss loves to show this photo um, because he says uh, it was what really helped him be able to tell the difference between our two crane species in Wisconsin. You gotta look at those little colored plastic bands on the leg of the white bird because that's the way to know you've got a whooping crane because clearly you can't tell the difference just from looking at them. Uh, I say Riley. And great for recreation and great for education. I won't spend a lot of time on that because you guys know this better than, than anybody. So let's turn quickly and look at the state of wetlands and watersheds in Wisconsin. Uh, historically, we were a very wetland rich state. We had more than 10 million acres of wetlands during pre-development times. That's a lot of wetlands. Uh, but we've changed the way water flows across our landscapes in part by um, draining or removing more than half of the original 10 million acres of wetlands. Uh, urban development, transportation infrastructure, upper watershed conversion, all of these things that I've talked about so far are among the things that have uh, changed the way water flows are in our landscapes. It's not just the loss of wetlands, but it's also changes to our landscapes and the way water flows there. Um, that photo on the left is the dredge um, that they used to uh, to drain Hor or to try to drain Horicon Marsh. That's an amazing story. If you don't know it, check it out. Wetland loss in Wisconsin is not spread out equally. Uh, it's much more uh, concentrated in the south. Um, the darker the red in this photo, the more loss has occurred. Um, it's mostly because of agriculture. Uh, the areas to the south were just more conducive, uh, easier to drain for agriculture. And even though we do have half of our wetlands uh, remaining, uh, many of them are in poor condition. Um, they are facing altered hydrology, invasive species, excess nutrients and sediments, and lots of other challenges. And so they're not able to do the work that we need them to do. When we lose this much wetland, and when we make these many changes to our landscapes, inevitably, you're going to see big changes on the landscape. And they're numerous and they're really challenging. Um, our communities are flooding, our rivers are running dirty. Again, this is a, a paired photo um, uh, uh, along a river um, with relatively intact uh, upper watershed wetlands on the left versus uh, the adjacent uh, river um, in a, in a watershed where the more conversion has happened in that upper watershed area. And you can see the difference in the color of the water. There's way more sediment in the water on the right. Our lands are eroding. That's a huge gully um, that was formed when there was a lot of development upstream and the wetland between the development and this area um, was also no longer functioning and no longer able to retain that water. So it went whooshing down and you see the results there. This is Grant County. This famous picture is Coon Valley and it was uh, the photo that is said to have launched the Federal Conservation Service, now the um, USDA. 
uh, an RCS, it's impossible to put things together once they're this far gone. And so we have to get at it a, a lot more uh, quickly than that. Our communities are suffering. This photo is from uh, the Lake Superior area after those enormous 2016 um, deluge. Uh, that's a lot of water. That's a very big culvert, as you can tell from my, my colleague Kyle there is not a small person, but he's standing next to that culvert, which was not nearly enough to handle the amount of rainflow. So how are we gonna manage this? How are our communities, how are we gonna turn this around? Regulations are great, and we have strong regulations in Wisconsin, but that only holds the line. Right? That doesn't bring more wetlands back to the landscape. That does not improve our wetlands, uh, make them uh, more numerous or uh, the acreage larger. We need more. We need restoration and management. And I'll just throw out that restoration is often used um, uh, as a sort of singular action term. Let's go restore something and then we're done. Uh, so we always pair it with management because restoration is a process. It's not a one-time deal. Um, and wetlands, uh, whether they're restored or not, they all need management. And we also need a watershed and landscape approach uh, because we need a lot more wetlands on the land, but they need to be in the right locations in order to provide the benefits that we need them to provide. And we don't need hundreds or thousands of acres. We need hundreds of thousands of acres. We have a lot of work to do if we're going to improve the health of our watersheds. So how do we do it? Because um, uh, we we work with, our organization works with landowners and communities, as I said at the start, to, under, to help them understand how wetlands can serve as solutions to the water issues they face. Because if they see wetlands as one of the tools that will help them in, uh, solve their problems, um, they're uh, more likely to see success in those solutions and to solve those problems. And we also work with those um, people and institutions, agencies who have influence on the landscape. That's landowners, federal and state agencies, county agencies, um, lots of folks who have uh, uh, an influence on how we are using the landscape. Landowners are particularly important because of the acreage of wetlands that we have remaining on the state, 75% are in private ownership, and as much as 85% of the restorable wetlands are also in private ownership. And so private landowners are gonna be hugely important to, uh, to caring for the wetlands that we have and uh, repairing those or restoring those that we need to put back on the landscape. So we need to make caring and restoring wetlands the norm for landowners and communities, but we can't have it be based on the sort of desire for wildlife. It has to solve uh, a more pressing um, uh, issues of issues that are causing financial um, hardship to the community and to the landowner. They need to see it as a benefit to them to, to involve wetlands. So we need to spend time to understand why wetlands are important for those challenges that that particular community is facing. We need to move beyond wildlife habitat. We need to view wetlands as solutions. Um, and those solutions must make sense to the landowners and communities. They have to make sense in urban areas, in agricultural areas, in forestry landscapes. Um, and that's what we are working towards doing. I'm gonna sort of close here with another video um, that describes uh, Actually, you know what, I'm looking at the time and I will skip this, but I will tell you where to find it. It's a lovely little video. You might recognize some of these people about uh, the Stone Lake community, but I'm looking at my time and wanna to get to your questions. So we'll, I'll put the link into that video so you can watch it later. How wonderful it is that nobody need wait a single moment before starting to improve the world. And I know that you already know this because of the work that you're doing. You are already contributing in your way to make the world a better place. Volunteer is one of the best ways you're already doing that. And there's so many great ways to do that. I love this picture of the lady in a dress with uh, her necklace. She was out for a fundraising meeting apparently and decided she wanted to go ban ducks. Great, move in, that's super great. Support the groups that are working for wetlands, whether it's in your local community, in your county, whether it's Wisconsin Wetlands Association, um, get involved with these as you are as lake monitors, but you know, perhaps there are others of you who are specifically involved with wetland groups in your community. Wisconsin Wetlands Association welcomes you as a member. We are a member supported organization and um, we'd be delighted to have you among our ranks um, so that we can share our information with you and you can share that with your communities. So a couple of takeaways uh, from today. Um, where do we go from here? My first, uh, my first joke is clean up your language. And this is where I wish I could see your faces because I would ask you to raise your hand. If you have ever said, I'm feeling really bogged down or swamped, 
those are all negative phrases, right, that we use when we're feeling overwhelmed with something, um, but it actually, it, it, it uh, promulgates this idea of wetlands as sort of negative things, and, and we need to turn that around. We need to show them as positive things. So, so pay attention to your language and see how often you use those negative uh, wetland phrases. When you're having conversations or working on planning that involves lakes, rivers, and streams, that's a very common set of words to come together, make sure you add the word wetlands into those conversations, into those plans, because very often wetlands are not included in the package. And as you have seen from today's presentation, they really need to be. Don't forget to look at the history. Make sure when you're doing planning um, and, and your communities are doing planning that you're looking at where wetland loss has occurred in your community because if you, if you miss that step, you're missing lots of opportunities to improve your situation. Similarly, look upstream. Uh, so many of our water problems cannot be solved where they occur. They have to be solved upstream um, and looking at, at, at landscape changes and wetland solutions upstream. And again, wetlands are more about uh, they're about way more than just wildlife. Wetlands are solutions and, and that's an important part of getting what we need done. We have a lot of tools. As I mentioned, we have a whole bunch of videos that we've created. They're all sort of three to four minutes long um, and they're all available for you to view and to use in your programming. We have a handbook for wetland landowners. We have a number of publications developed for um, local communities who are looking at planning and zoning opportunities. Um, we have a lot of resources that we're happy to share with you. And the most important thing that we end our talks with always, the most important way for you to get involved is to keep your feet wet. Um, I know you already are doing that for your, for your work with our lakes, but when you get out, keep this presentation in mind and pay particular attention to your lake's watershed and what's happening there. Are those things happening in the watershed above your lake? Are they affecting its health? Are there ways you and your community can work together to incorporate, incorporate wetlands as solutions? And, and how can WWA help? Um, we, I thank you for all of the important work that you do. I thank you for being here today and listening to this presentation. And I apologize, I didn't get uh, to your questions during, but I'm very welcome to take them now. Uh, and thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Katie. We do have one question so far, I believe in the chat. For everyone else, please add your questions to the chat and we can take lots of questions. We have plenty of time until one o'clock to take questions. Um, Dave Hart is up on Pelican Lake in Oneida County, I believe it is, Eastern Oneida County. And he's asking about wetlands as a storage for phosphorus. Uh, he says that when, high, when there's high water, the water from the wetland enters the lake. And he's wondering if, they, if there's a way to reduce the phosphorus loading into the lake from the wetland. Uh, again, it's a very unique to the particular landscape, but I would encourage um, David to look upstream from the wetland if there is an upstream of the wetland because uh, that phosphorus, that, there's no doubt that sometimes the phosphorus comes out of wetlands, but more often than not, that water is passing through from one place to the next and that the phosphorus source uh, may very well be upstream. Um, uh, Joy Zedler for years here in Madison has been doing research on both wetland, uh, phosphorus and nitrogen and ways that um, wetlands can be uh, studying for one, what, how, how much uh, nutrient reduction there can be from wetlands, whether there is or not, um, and, and more effective ways to get that to happen. So that's some interesting work that I just point out um, for you to take a further look at. But again, most often um, the phosphorus is not sort of generating itself in large quantity from the wetland, but coming from another source upstream. Great. Diane is wondering if you can add the link to the video that you didn't play. <laughs> I um, can, for sure. You can send, uh, Zoom has uh, deactivated most of the sharing capabilities through chat because of security issues. So I think if you put the link in the chat, it won't be active for people. Uh, I don't even know if they can copy and paste the link. So if you want to send it to me, I will send it along sure. with the recording and sure. I'll send that out today or tomorrow. Great, uh, and the easy way to point people towards it is if you go to wisconsinwetlands.org, uh, the very big picture at the top of the screen, if you click on that, that goes straight to our videos page and all of the, there's probably 10 or so videos that we produced in the last couple of years and they're all available there for your um, viewing and downloading. Perfect. 
Melanie has a question about the difference between floodplain forests and forested wetlands. Right, um, and a lot of that has to do, and again, I would point you to the great presentation Ryan O'Connor gave for Wisconsin Wetlands Association last week. It has to do with whether the water is overflowing the banks of a stream or a river and spreading out laterally, or is the flooding coming from a, a rising groundwater level that uh, instead of being below the soil surface, and it's not just groundwater, it's also pooling of surface water, but it's not related to um, lateral spreading from a, a, a river or a stream. Did that make sense? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Next question from Matt. He says his backyard is very wet in the spring and the fall, so he can't cut the grass or rake the leaves, and he's interested in eliminating the lawn and turning it into a wetland, and how, how should he go about doing that? Sure. Well, I think that's a great strategy because who needs to knock their head against a wall over and over trying to get grass to grow somewhere that clearly nature has other plans for. So um, seize the moment and uh, go for um, a more of a wetland community. There are lots of native plant nurseries um, who specialize in this and can even help you with sort of picking species and designing designing your rain garden or your wetland, whatever you want to help. I'm not sure quite how big it is, whether it's a wetland or a rain garden. It, the same, you know, the, lots of the functions are similar and they're both really good. Um, and so I would encourage you to, to look for a lit native landscaping nursery in your area that is familiar with your soil types and familiar with the, the species that are native to your area. Um, sometimes you can see native plants on sale at your standard greenhouse and uh, sometimes that's fine, but sometimes those plants are um, from further afield than you might want them to be. Uh, so just pay attention to that and, and support our local uh, native plant nurseries. Uh, any other questions on that that I need to touch on? Well, I would add a couple other things. Uh, Matt, since we don't know where you're located, but there are native plant nurseries around the state, uh, I'd also encourage you to check out any Wild Ones chapters in your area. Um, I'm the president of the Central Wisconsin chapter of Wild Ones, but most of the, ch the counties in the state are represented by one of the chapters, and Wild Ones is a natural landscaping organization, a volunteer organization. Um, so you could potentially find people with a lot of knowledge and experience in your area that might be willing to give you some tips or help you with that process. I'd also talk to your county land, water, land and water conservation department. Uh, and maybe a local DNR contact and, and tell them what you're interested in doing and there may be cost sharing options available or they may be able to fry, provide other tips to you. Um, some of the native plant nurseries around the state do specialize in wetland plants too. If you want to email me, I can send you a few uh, names of nurseries that I've worked with in central Wisconsin. Um, the next question from Mike is, what is a delineated wetland definition that I hear often? Are many kettles in the Ice Age Trail area wetlands? Yes, is the short answer. The longer answer is that delineation is the sort of legal regulatory process that has to happen to draw a line on the map of where a wetland is and where a wetland isn't from a regulatory perspective. Um, it's really important to to really make sure you're seeing that as a regulatory task because there's no such thing as sort of the border of a wetland because it really depends on the season, right? The three things they look at when delineating are um, soil type, um, the presence of water loving wetland indicator plants and the presence of water at or near the surface for at least some portion of the year. Right? Those are the sort of three things they're looking for. And from a regulatory perspective, you have to draw a line because they have to be able to say to a developer, you can build here, but you can't build there. Our law applies to this little place, but not to this little place next door. Um, that's important, but the, it's more important to sort of see wetlands as part of that greater landscape uh, and the, the you, as we've talked about in this presentation, um, where the water comes from above the wetland uh, really affects the health of that wetland. And so drawing a line around it is a little bit art, artificial and arbitrary and important for regulatory purposes, but really not reflective of ecology. Did I get the whole answer to that? I mean, is there more to that question that I didn't touch on? I think so. I think he was just wondering what that means to be a, a delineated wetland or what the wetland delineation is. Right. So it's just to draw that line for regulatory purposes. Mm -hmm. And did you touch on the kettle question? Uh, so kettles uh, definitely are wetlands and often those are um, 
uh, hydrologically isolated, that is they don't have a sort of outlet um, into some form of surface water and they are, uh, they're all throughout the Kettle Moraine area. They're gorgeous wetlands. Uh, one of the regulatory challenges, um, at least with federal protections, is that um, uh, sometimes those quote unquote isolated wetlands are not covered by federal um, regulatory protections. Our state does protect most of them. There have been some changes in the last couple of years that make it not able, I can't say they protect all of them anymore, but um, those, uh, they are, they don't have a surface water connection, so they have a different regulatory uh, stand standard, but they are definitely part of the system and they're definitely connected via the water. Mm -hmm. And many of those kettles are very large and they're called kettle lakes. Indeed. Um, Valerie wonders if property owners can join your organization. Absolutely, we welcome you. Uh, that would be terrific. Again, wisconsinwetlands.org. There's a little button at the top that says donate. And if you, uh, that's where you become a member. Any donation through that portal uh, makes you a member of our organization. And we'd be delighted to have you. And we have a bunch of resources and um, be happy to, to work with you more. Can you also talk about uh, efforts to work with landowners and how Wisconsin Wetlands Association approaches landowners? Sure. Uh, well, as a statewide organization, um, we are, it's hard for us to talk to every landowner, right? Uh, it's a very big state, but we have tried to create some tools that provide landowners with um, some of the structure that they might use to think about uh, wetlands on their property. Um, we also have had workshops in different parts of the state over the years, partnering with um, different uh, land trusts and agencies. Um, we are happy uh, on a time available basis to come and visit your property and um, help you understand, you know, it's, a very, it's very hard to give advice about a property when you haven't ever been there before. It's a boots on the ground kind of necessity. Um, so that's something that we are sometimes able um, to do when we're out and about in the field. Um, and we can talk to you on the phone too if we can't get a, a field visit. So our website, in addition to the landowner handbook, there's a bunch of information that was tough to put in a printed publication because it's a lot of links and things um, that we do have uh, in a special section for landowners on our website, including lots of links to where you can find maps and how you can get technical um, support and lots of other information. So check that out. And um, if you have a question that isn't answered there, feel free to reach out to us and we'll give it our best shot. Okay. Kim was wondering, uh, I think in response to an earlier question, do you have to actually add native plants or what, what if you just don't mow your wet lawn anymore? What would happen? <laughs> Well, that's another approach, and sometimes that can be very successful. It depends really on your context, right? Are you uh, a, a landowner? Is your property out uh, in the midst of what otherwise is sort of natural communities, and so the chances that native things would find their way there reasonably high? Uh, maybe that's going to work for you, but there's a lot of invasive things out there too um, that are going to come in, and there's a lot of sort of Maybe they're not invasive, but they're sort of on the weedy end of things. So it depends on how much, um, it depends on what your goals are. And that's actually the sort of fundamental question that we always ask landowners, what's your goal for this? Um, and so if your goal is a diverse, uh, rich community, then you have one approach. And if your goal is to stop um, mowing and just have a nice place where the water can infiltrate, then you have a different um, a different option. But it, you won't necessarily get uh, the kinds of plants that you want by just stopping mowing, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Great, I would agree with that perfectly. Um, Ron wonders if you can review the impacts of the new wetlands law from two years ago. Uh, uh, yes, and I will caveat that with uh, the statement that I am not a member of our policy staff. And so I, uh, I don't have the nitty gritty details. And if you want those, I would really encourage you to reach out to our policy staff, our executive director, Tracy Hames, and our policy director, Erin O'Brien. And we have a, um, a legislative liaison now, um, uh, Jennifer Western Hauser. And all three of those people are way more qualified than I am to answer that question. But essentially the, the proposal, so when there was a change, many, many years ago when there was a change in what the Federal Clean Water Act protected, it removed 
uh, protections for the so-called isolated wetlands from federal protections. And Wisconsin was the very first state in the nation to add those protections back at a state level. Um, Wisconsin Wetlands Association was involved in that a very long time ago. We're very proud of it. Um, the, the law two years ago uh, uh, sought to remove some of those protections in order to address some concerns that legislators were hearing from their constituents where uh, it was felt that the, uh, the regulators were overstepping their bounds in what they were seeking to protect um, through our state level uh, legislation. Uh, and so initially the proposal was much worse and was basically taking away all those protections and it was, it was winnowed down to be something that was not good, but a lot better that removed protections from certain areas. It depended on how close they were to an urban area, meaning that um, the closer you were, the more likely it was going to be okay to fill an isolated wetland. Um, it, there's some other intricacies to that that I um, can't get at right now in my brain, but um, essentially it removed protections from uh, some isolated wetlands, but not all isolated wetlands. And I'll leave it there and encourage Ron to contact um, our office to get more information and email us the best way right now since we're all working from home. Okay, thank you. Uh, Eric wonders about uh, his property, which has a seasonal wetland that merges into permanent ones and it's been heavily invaded by reed canary grass. He assumes correctly that that is known to crowd out native plants. He's wondering if we have any strategies or solutions for him. Yeah, well, welcome to the club. Um, there probably is hardly a landowner in the state of Wisconsin that doesn't have reed canary grass in their wetland, I am sad to say, but it's sort of uh, ubiquitous and very challenging to control. Um, we There are some strategies uh, for, if not controlling it, because I'm not sure that it can be controlled, but to reduce its prevalence to allow those other plants to, um, you know, have more chance. Um, we uh, if, if you have, well, one of the things, I'll step back and say, one of the things that we encourage generally across the board with respect to invasive species is to not manage invasive species just as that's your goal, but look at the bigger picture. I generally think of invasive species as kind of like a scab on a wound, right? It's the evidence that something bigger is happening. Uh, there might have been changed hydrology. There might be more nutrients coming in than came in historically, there might be more or less water or coming in at different times than would sort of naturally be the cycle. And all of those things can give the advantage to invasive species. And so what we encourage landowners to do is really stop and take a look at that. Where's my water coming from? Where did, what did things look like historically? How has that changed? And then looking at in that context, what can I do? If you have control over um, your hydrology, that is if you have a way to either, um, you know, if you have a water control structure that allows you to pond up more water or to drain the water, if you can get in and do some mowing um, when it's dry, that can really help. Burning some can sometimes help a, a combination. You know, there's a fellow named Craig Annan who knows more about reed canary grass than just about anybody else in the state of Wisconsin. He's a private consultant, and he's given some very persuasive presentations of sites he's worked on. And you know, we're talking about six or seven or ten years. I mean, it's not a short process, but that through controlled burning and spot um, herbiciding and seeding with native species, they've been able to take things that really were mono, uh, mono uh, monolithic stands of, of reed canary grass and actually bring back a uh, pretty diverse rich sedge meadows. It's not gone, reed canary grass, it's still there, but it's it's really in the minority. So it's a, it's a many years commitment and it's a multi-pronged commitment and it really depends on um, a repaired hydrology as one of the uh, one of the key foundations. So I'm sorry if that's not um, the answer that you wanted, but there's the reality. And there we do have some of that information on our website, uh, WisconsinWetlands.org, in the for landowners section. And the Wisconsin DNR has a nice publication on reed canary grass in particular. Uh, you may want to check that out. And I agree that I, I would uh, consider contacting a consultant or another uh, DNR or land, land and water conservation person and, and talking about this because every property is unique and it's hard to make one recommendation without having seen the property. Um, so. And Paul, I'll just say that that I know that Reed Canary Grass publication is one of the links on our resources page um, on the for landowners section of our website. Um, so take you can get that link and other other invasive species resources there. Great. 
And Valerie has a question about controlled burns on marshes. She has a sedge marsh and wonders what your thoughts on controlled burns. Sure. Uh, well, people often don't make a connection between burning and wetlands, and there certainly are wetland types that would not have burned historically. Um, uh, from what I have read and learned, uh, sedge meadows um, are, because they're sort of on the drier end, um, they may very well have been um, routinely subject to prescribed burns, and, and that can be a good technique. One of the, one of the Tying sort of tying back to the last question about reed canary grass, one of the benefits of burning um, in wetlands is is removing the sort of heavy duff layer that accumulates when you have plants like cattails and reed canary grass that are really dominating because it literally sort of smothers out any other thing trying to grow. And so, mowing is a way to remove the duff layer. Um, grazing can be a way applied properly uh, to remove that duff layer, and burning can be a way to that duff layer and so it depends on your situation and again I would advocate having somebody who knows more um, than I do about this to come out and just give you some consultation again taking a look at your situation uh, what the parameters are in terms of what's around you and how hard it would be um, to do the to do the burn and often you can hire people to actually come in and do that burn and, and bring the liability insurance and things with them to make sure it's done safely so so that's a qualified yes um, but not all wetlands uh, would have burned naturally um, and you just need to do it of course safely great thank you again katie i think that's all that we have in the chat uh, we can give it another minute here but i'll just share another reminder that next week's webinar is on tuesday the 5th at noon i'm putting a link in the chat right now so if you haven't registered for it yet you can find the link in the chat box that goes to the registration page or you can find it also in the latest edition of the citizen lake monitoring network newsletter uh, of course always email me if you have any questions or if the the link in the chat is not working can connect, uh, contact me directly and if we don't have any other questions I haven't seen any so thank you everyone for joining today and thank you to Katie and I hope it's to see pleasure. you all again next week thank you so much thanks everybody for listening